Okay, welcome back. We're going to continue our hearing. The next panel will include Fiora Mattis, Joyce Friedman of Voters for Animal Rights, Natasha Resnick, Judith Lusgarden of Humanity and Ethics for, for Shelter Animals, Marilyn Galfin, Voices for Shelter Animals, Craig Seaman, Voices for Shelter Animals, Ryan Shapiro, Humane Society of the U.S., Chris O'Leary, Wild Bird Fund. Okay, once again, we have too few chairs, but we promise we'll hear from all of you as we swap out. Uh, would you like to start us off, please? Thank you, Councilmember Levine. My name is Joyce Friedman. I am a New York City resident and on the Board of Directors of Voters for Animal Rights. I'm testifying today in st strong support of the bill to ban the sale of foie gras and intro 1202, the bill to prohibit the trafficking of wild birds in New York City. Regarding foie gras, I, do, I will just say plant-based delicious Faux gras exists, and it is called F-A-U-X, faux gras. Try it sometime. I will focus on intro 1202, a much needed bill that will protect New York City's wild birds from the illegal yet common practice of being violently stolen from our parks and streets to be used as live targets in Pennsylvania pigeon shooting contests. I've worked on this issue for many years. Individuals are paid to lure large flocks of pigeons with bird seed and then violently snap up hundreds of pigeons at once in a large mechanical net, often resulting in painful broken legs or wings to these terrified, fragile birds. Sparrows, starlings, and robins often get caught in these wings too. Then the netter races to their vehicle and throws in the struggling netted birds and speeds away. This has been witnessed many times by horrified New Yorkers, as my friend has said. I have, my friends quote, I have firsthand experience in dealing with the unscrupulous pigeon netters who with impunity have been working as an organized unit in and around the five boroughs of New York City for decades. I caught them red-handed netting a flock on 42nd Street and single-handedly got them to release the birds, though it wasn't easy. I have heard of devastated flocks of pigeons who were completely wiped out when the frail women who cared for them could not stand up to these criminals who kept coming back to net them. Decades of research has shown by the HSUS and other groups that these birds are transported to the last remaining brutal pigeon shooting contest in Pennsylvania. Prior to being shot, the pigeons are kept in dark, tiny boxes without food and water so as to disorient them so when they're released at the shoot, they cannot quickly fly away. Often they are maimed and left to suffer until they die, and believe it or not, children will twist their heads off. Sounds like a horror movie, it is actually reality. HSU, HSUS research has shown that multiple nettings have occurred in our city in the one to two weeks prior to scheduled Pennsylvania pigeon shoots. And HSUS undercover investigators have followed netters as they transported the birds out of New York for these shoots. Why does this continue even though it's illegal? Our current laws are not sufficient. The current week penalty is just the cost of doing business. When arrests are made by the NYPD, the criminals are quickly back on the streets. This bill will simply, and I'll wrap up, increase the penalty to a misdemeanor and make the law clearer and easier for law enforcement to protect our urban wildlife. Thank you, Council Member Carlina Rivera, for recognizing the need to protect New York City birds from this cruel practice, and we look forward to the bill's swift, swift passage. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman and Honorable Council Members. My name is Brian Shapiro, New York State Director for the Humane Society of the United States. Regarding the Foie Gras Bill 1378, I'd like to applaud the Council for recognizing the difference between ethical veterinarians and scientists who are here to speak from the heart, and uh, as earlier was mentioned by someone from the industry, uh, unbiased as opposed to those who, much like the tobacco industry and the auto industry, were paid uh, purposefully to present a particular point of view to prop up uh, an industry. Speaking of the industry, I do want to mention we heard a lot about a field trip to Hudson Valley foie gras. A longtime lawsuit by the Humane Society of the United States uh, ended less than 10 years ago with Hudson Valley foie gras. Uh, having been shown to have violations of the Clean Water Act and needing to pay $50,000 in remediation uh, for that pollution. 
So that is something that has affected the community uh, there as well, which is actually where I live in the upstate area. <coughs> Additionally, we support 1425. This is sensible legislation regarding the carriage horses. Following up on what uh, Joyce Friedman just mentioned, we support intro 1202 in relation to the prohibiting the trafficking of wild birds. We have found HSU as a correlation between incidents of netting large groups of pigeons on the streets in New York City and their transportation to Pennsylvania for something sickening known as pigeon shoots. Uh, we have, through investigations, followed automobiles there. There's a timing issue where when these nettings happen, they do end up in Pennsylvania. We also, this is quite gruesome, in order to remove bans from homing pigeons that have been captured in New York City, uh, we know for a fact that the legs have been removed from these birds while they're alive prior to them being shot in Pennsylvania. Wildlife is a resource for all New York City residents and these nettings are selfish and they're illegal and we urge the city council to move forward on this legislation. Um, regarding the city, uh, excuse me, the shelter bills, the shelters presented very well. We urge the city council to bring them in as stakeholders and thank you very much for your service to New York City and for the time to present our opinion today. Thank you, Mr. Shapiro. Yes, sir. Thank you. First, I would like to thank the committee for recognizing the importance of these issues. My name is Natasha Resnick. I am from Brooklyn. I support Intro 1378 to ban foie gras in New York City. Foie gras is fatty liver. By definition, it is the inflammation of the liver. If you or I get diagnosis from the doctor, we would be immediately put on a diet. So how do ducks and geese get fatty liver? By being forced pipes down their throats, which forces large amounts of food into their stomachs, and then repeat it several times a day. Their throats and stomachs can be damaged and forcing a pipe, uh, by forcing a pipe down. And to ensure that they fatten up as quickly as possible, they are kept in cages to restrict their movements. While you and I can go on a healthy plant-based diet and exercise to save our liver and our lives, the geese and ducks do not have such an option. They endure the torture every day throughout their short lives until slaughter. There is nothing natural about this, and it should not be continued based on the past, and therefore it's okay. That was then. We can do better now. Also support intro 1425 to get horses out of the heat, intro 1202 to protect wild birds, and more plant-based options for a healthy New York. Thank you once again. Thank you. Uh, Flora had to leave ill, so I'll be reading for her. Uh, my name is Margaret Lee. I live in Manhattan. I'm an animal advocate and a lover of our city's pigeons. I'm reading the testimony of an investigator with shark showing animals respect and kindness. Thank you, council members. My name is Stuart Chavetz, investigator with Showing Animals Respect and Kindness, or SHARK. We urge you to pass intro 1202. SHARK has investigated and exposed pigeon shoots in numerous states throughout the country for the past 30 years. We have video documenting hundreds of these violent and horrifically cruel spectacles. The vast majority of this abuse occurs in Pennsylvania. It is well known that many of the pigeons used in these shoots come from New York City. In a pigeon shoot, live birds are mechanically ejected from boxes called traps. They are tossed two or three feet into the air and shot at close range. The floor of the trap is electrified to force even the most docile birds to spread their wings and attempt to escape. This is killing for the sake of killing. It is deeply disturbing that there are twisted people who take pleasure in spilling this innocent blood. Few of the victims die quickly. Birds shot somewhere on the contest fields are grabbed, jumped on, or tackled by the workers who are often young preteen boys and girls. These children are allowed to torture the animals by tearing off the birds' feathers, wings, or heads, or by stomping them. The criminal behavior of pigeon shoots goes beyond the animals in that children are taught that this kind of pitiless abuse is acceptable. We have, we have seen still living birds thrown into garbage cans by these child workers. Live birds are smothered under the bodies, the bodies of more victims. We have seen birds who have somehow survived all these horrors only to be burned or buried alive. Pigeons who are shot but can still fly far enough to avoid retrieval may die minutes or hours later. Some birds suffer for days before finally succumbing to their wounds or predation, hunger, dehydration, infection, or exposure. 
Even those we have rescued have suffered a mortality rate of more than 50% because they are already on the brink of starvation. The birds are given little water and even less food in the days before the shoot, which saves money for the pigeon dealers and makes them easier to shoot. As someone who has personally rescued hundreds of these wounded and dying pigeons, I can tell you that each and every one of them is an individual. And any bird expert can tell you how intelligent these members of the Dove family are. We have included links to videos with graphic documentation of these events. However, I must caution, this is not for the faint of heart. If there is a pigeon population problem, there are humane options available. Okay, thank you. Please. I'm Craig Seaman, Voices for Shelter Animals. <clears throat> I support intro 1478 and 1502, uh, 1478 for creating a badly needed Department of Animal Welfare. The, de uh, de the Department of Health has no infrastructure or mission to care about animal welfare. Handing ani handling animals through the Bureau of Veterinary and, and Pest Control speaks loudly to that. In 2002, Comptroller Bill Thompson audited the ACC and noted the uselessness of the DOH inspection reports. They were simply a list of yes-no checkboxes all about the facility and nothing to do with the animals. Thompson said there was absolutely no known criteria even for the simple yes, no questions. 17 years later, the DOH is still using the exact same form. They have nothing to do with real world animal welfare. The debatable live release rate masks underlying serious problems. Scott Stringer's 2013 report, Led Astray, reported that most animals transferred to rescues are sick. Six years later, that hasn't changed. As of 2016, only 7% of the animals transferred to rescues were classified as, health, as healthy. Uh, reporting stopped for two years. That the DOH did not address the absence of that reporting or the rampant illness amongst transfers exemplifies a department that has no concern for animal health. While the DOH responded to the avian flu outbreak amongst cats in early 2017 by removing them and cleaning the facility, it was only due to the potential transmission to humans. That's their mission. They continue to do nothing to address the pneumonia and the calicivirus reported to us by the rescues who are far too afraid to speak out to the ACC and the DOH. The isolation facilities for the treatment of sick animals and the AC are inadequate based on this committee's April 2018 hearing. And I'll, I'll conclude with, we need a department that focuses on animal welfare, understanding how to help our homeless non-human family, and the need for transparency in the task force in 1502 for euthanasia so the community can respond and resolve these issues. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Hi, Marilyn Galfin, Voices for Shelter Animals. We support 1478, the Department of Animal Welfare, replacing the DOH and the Bureaus of Veterinary and Pest Control Services to oversee the animal care centers. Companion animals continue to be treated as such, as pests, with DOH's antiquated status quo model of sheltering, the convenience killing of adoptable, treatable dogs and cats for population control. DOH continues use of behavior assessments, labeling animals with simple behavior issues and fear of behavior based behavior as positive threats and some are being killed for it when the Journal of Veterinary Medicine deems assessments invalid and call for a moratorium on them. Ed Bokes, the executive director of ACC 2003-6, to when asked, does the DOH have the best interest of AC and C or the animals in its care at heart? The answer is clearly no, they do not. Nothing has changed. In my numerous calls and emails to DOH about my concerns about the kennel cough in the shelter, which an anonymous rescue claim 
times that every dog is coming out of the shelter with it, and my concerns about Khaleesi virus and cats potentially fatal, I got no response. 2010 to 2013, ACC didn't even have a medical director. 20 plus years, DOH has no immediate solution for lack of ISO facilities and controlling disease. The endless cycle of vulnerable homeless animals coming in healthy, getting sick from the shelter, and potentially killed for these easily treatable dog and cat colds will continue. We need a Department of Animal Welfare to better address this issue. We hope that this department will consist of people with, who support the progressive model of sheltering, who have animal experience, who know, who are emotionally invested, and understand that every homeless animal is a sentient being and deserves to be treated as such. It's not a number, it's not a live release rate. And to ensure that every animal that enters the shelter will be treated humanely, get proper medical and emergency care, and the resources to ensure that animals come out alive, healthy, and are given a second chance of life in a new home to get the love they deserve. We support 1502 and the task force with the community involvement so that even rescues and volunteers can freely speak without the fear of retribution. And to allow a healthy environment and not the toxic environment on social media so we can work together to find the policies and best practices for animals to save lives. And in our vision, we hope that the Animal Welfare Department will extend into protecting all animals of the city, companion and non-companion, to end exploitation, inhumane treatment and cruelty, and put an end to these commerce of cruelty, the fur industry, puppy mill, pet stores, fall crop, carriage horse, and just slaughterhouses it's and more. If, if you can wrap up, please. Okay, this is it. My wrap up. Here we go. Let's make the city humane. Let's show we have compassion and moral correctness, and let's start with 1478 and 1502, and let's help our homeless animals. Thank you. Okay. Uh, was there another speaker for this panel? Could you um, uh, maybe grab a seat so you have access to one of the mics? My name is Judith Lusgarten. People of wisdom know there's two sides to every story versus all the sugar and spice rah-rah. We desperately need to replace DOH oversight of ACC with an animal welfare department and an animal advisory board with the best interest of these shelter animals at heart. We need intro 1478. The city's waited 20 years for pop proper humane oversight. The animal law we, are, we work under was created in 1894, 125 years ago. It's archaic. Yet here we are in New York City, supposedly the most progressive city in the world, still working under an obsolete animal law from over a century ago. The law states that in any city of two million or more, mayor has full control. Mayors don't have the time nor qualifications for this today, which is why in progressive states, there's an animal care service advisory boards providing recommendations to mayors and city councils. Intro 1502, we need honest, accountability and transparency on shelter euthanasia, behavior evaluations, accessors and their qualifications. It's critical as these evaluations are used for labeling animals for euthanasia decisions and new hope rescue only. It's not fair to these living souls not to have qualified ethical professionals handling this. Most every animal's assessments have been proven incorrect once out of ACC, especially once they decompress. Animals terrified in a shelter environment, puppies biting on leash, dogs lunging, pulling towards another dog or human. It's dogs being dogs. We all see this every day on the street, but at ACC, it's a death sentence. This business can now be done successfully when proper people are put in place, implementing plans correctly versus retrofitted. There are now proven success records. It's growing one by one across our country as kill pounds, large and small, are being converted by various modern shelter reform, by no kill equation, by companion animal Protection Act, as the momentum of shelter reform continues to build, it will apex and then it will snowball. Already, everywhere you turn, you hear of another shelter converting. Yet in New York City, we still have these archaic kill shelters. A task force of advocates is needed to develop proper ethical shelter practice, practices, recommend changes in policies and law. We must know the criteria for animals not made available. Silent kills. January 23rd board meeting, they said, 
that the small animals won't ever be on a kill list as they can place all of them, quote unquote, even if they're Cujo in a small body. Clearly that was untruthful chatter as they're killing them now right and left. We need a fair and honest evaluation matrix. Watching these wonderful family animals who live peacefully and lovingly with children and other animals being killed unfairly and unnecessarily with plenty of empty cages weighs heavily. I send ACC wonderful programs happening elsewhere to look at all the time. They're everywhere. If other cities can build programs for our most vulnerable, so can we. It's our duty as de decent, civil, humane people. The ag gag clauses in the contracts and, and, the employees and, and, and rescues have to sign, you gonna stop me? Yes, I'm afraid so, only because <laughs> we have this many people waiting to speak and we're gonna lose the room. But we appreciate your uh, statement. And we have one more person here from the panel, I believe. Is that right? Okay, please. Rita McMahon, director of the Wild Bird Fund. The Wild Bird Fund is New York City's only wildlife rehabilitation facility. And we support Intro 202, which will provide protection to all of New York City's wildlife. The Department of Environmental Conservation and the United States Fish and Wildlife Service protect native and migratory species, respectively. Though these federal, and state agencies prohibit the trafficking of wild birds, there are no protections for non-migratory and non-native birds, which include pigeons, starlings, sparrows, cormorants, mute swans, and other bird species. At present, wild birds are captured in New York City to provide easy targets for canned shoots in other states, particularly Pennsylvania. Feral pigeons are regularly netted on New York City streets, then transported out of state. They are not fed or given water for days. The day of the shoot, the birds are tucked into spring-loaded boxes. The shooter, armed with a shotgun, takes aim as one by one the birds are quickly released to fly up and be shot. It is a contest to see how many birds can be killed in the shortest time. These shoots can last up to 12 hours of non-stop shooting. Thousands of birds are maimed but often not killed. That is left for the boys, the hired hands who stomp them tear off the heads of live birds, throw living birds in garbage bins, or burn and bury them alive. The trauma these animals experience is horrific. Cases are brought to the Wild Bird Fund and we see the suffering. Most die from their injuries and the stress of the ordeal. Even those who are rescued and are given food and water almost never regain interest in living. The greatest sorrow of a rehabilitator is to see the fear in the eyes of an animal in your hands that you're trying to help that has been terribly abused by your fellow man. The Humane Society of the United States, Shark, and many others have tried to stop the carnage, but it still goes on. Putting a fine or a penal time on trafficking wild birds at the source, which is New York City, is the best solution possible. The one addition we request is for D, exempt persons, to have exempt persons include any person who is rescuing a bird who is injured, orphaned, or otherwise in danger of imminent harm. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I think we have one more speaker on this panel, or are we, we're all set. Okay, thank you all very, very much. Next up we have uh, V. Grassi. Uh, on behalf of horse carriages. Do you want to hear me? Pimitar Krasev. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing that name. Ian McKeever. Allison Clark from the Harry Warner Vet. Patricia Safran, Cole McKeever, Johnny Smith, Ann Fox, Ahmet Belisi, Tony Donofrio. Okay. Ma'am, on the left end, would you like to start us? I'll give you both. Well, this is good. Oh, well, you can't do this way. No, no, but I'll hand it in. Ma'am, would you like to start? Hand it in. Yes, okay. Okay. There's that. 
is mine and it is good next to them. Okay. My name Could you make sure your microphone is on and that you're speaking into the mic? Hi. My name is Jeannie Grassi and I've been a carriage driver for years. <coughs> and I ride and drive horses. I've owned horses, I've rescued horses. I'm speaking because there's a lack of facts here, and I want this on the record. I just spoke to my vet on the phone in the Marble Halls. He's a major New York vet, riding horses, carriage horses, official horses. And he said, I said to him, how many heat deaths have there been in the past five, 10 years? He said, Zero, zero in the past five years. My records go back seven. Not even in 10 years do I remember one. Let me repeat that, zero. We've had horses that do have some heat issues and we prefer to send them away for summer vacations. Those are usually the heavier horses. We bring in lighter horses. We have had cases where horses trip on the road. However, that's usually due to the failure of the city to fix the roads, uneven surfaces. Those photos that the animal rights have made of horses who have tripped and gone down have been portrayed as heat cases. This is a vile distortion and it's profiteering. And you can thank PETA, New York class, whoever you want for this, but in particular, a horse named Norman, a few years ago, a pain horse, who tripped and went down. Norman, by the way, is fine. He's a riding horse today, but he was used as a poster child to collect donations and used at our expense because it was portrayed as a heat case. In point of fact, it was 72 degrees when he went down on that summer night. Actually, it was September. So, so this is a degree of distortion that your committee is dealing with. I don't expect the fairest hearing here because the mayor has taken a parasitic approach to the carriage industry. He's become almost a demagogue, dog, excuse me, a demagogue on the subject and has received much money and seven investigations. But I wanna say one thing. Former commissioner of the park, Henry Stern, seeing that this legal lynch mob was developing against the carriages, said, I do not think they should be sentenced, sentenced to death by starvation. And that's what I think intro 1425 is really about. Because it would drop the current 90 degree law, which has been holding just fine, to maybe 80 with humidity and cut out our summer season and deliver to the mayor and his donors exactly what he wants, which is to shut down the carriages before the emails come out, which he whited out on how much money he took. This is white out. Th th thank you, Ms. Grassi. Uh, you're, you're over time. Uh, actually, you are getting a fair hearing here, as is everybody. And just to explain to you, uh, City Hall Civics 101, you're on the City Council side of the building. We draft, introduce, hear, and vote on legislation ourselves which the mayor may then sign or choose not to sign, uh, but don't confuse the two sides of the building. Um, I think what you've seen here over the last five hours is a thoughtful, measured discussion in which all sides uh, have been able to speak. I hope and, so. And you have been afforded that same time, and now we need to move on because we still have a lot of other people who also want to be heard, including Sir, members of this panel. Are you not a sponsor of this bill? We're going to move on to the next uh, Yes, and so speaker. you're in favor Thank of you, this. Thank you, Ms. Grassi. So Pre I'm not feeling I input. get a fair hearing. I would All like right. a fair recording. And you can run for the city council if you want to ask questions and hearings. Thank you. Please, sir. White out. White out. Hi, how are you doing? Uh, I'm from New York. I grew up around Brooklyn and in and out of Pennsylvania and sometimes in Italy. I always kept my life around horses and uh, around the equine life. I've learned from the best of the best, including my father, my aunt, my grandfather, on my mother's side and my father's side. And I went around the United States and I've learned more about the way different parts of the United States and also different parts of the world treat horses. And so I may not be that old, but I have learned from people who you want to take advice from. 
And I've seen parts of the world and parts of the United States that don't really treat their horses as good as, as, good as we do in, the, in New York. I'm not always here to see it, but my father did make a living off of it. And there was many nights where he wouldn't come home because he had to take care of the horse. And that just shows me that he loves that horse that, that we grew up with, a white horse named Julieta, just as much as he loves me. And there was many nights that he would stay home taking care of me and not go to see the horses and send his workers to go. So basically what I'm saying is, with all the experience that I have seen around, even if I haven't been around too long, I take advice from the right people and I see that there's a lot worse things going on around the world and around the United States than there is going around around here. There's a lot of things that we can fix. I'm not saying that we're perfect, but I'm saying that we're doing a lot better than a lot of other places are. And I'm proud of that, and I'm proud to be an origin of that. And I'm proud to be my father's son to learn from one of the best there is in the business. And I just think that this law shouldn't pass because I think everything's going good and the people who put it into place were thinking the right thing when they did put it into place. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please, please, no, no disruptions. Um, Ma'am, please, would you like to speak? Yeah. Greetings. I'm honored to have the opportunity to speak before the council. My name is Patricia Safran. I was a contributing editor for Horse Directory magazine since 1999 and have also written for the major website Equine Information Exchange. I've been a horse enthusiast and friendly observer of the Central Park horse industry for over 30 years. As to intro 1425, no equine veterinarian publicly endorsed or crafted the bill. This is because it is unscientific to add a human humidity index to the existing 90 degree Fahrenheit heat index already successfully used and preferred by park professionals for the carriage horses. I urge the council to withdraw the bill or vote against it. The 90 degree Fahrenheit extreme has kept the horses safe without illnesses and adding a human humidity index will adversely affect the horses by keeping them inactive in their stables for unnecessary days. I spoke to council member Keith Powers for 10 minutes in person about this proposed bill and the new routes that and later met with his office. I had mentioned to Keith that there's an equine index covered by the FEI report, which I sent to him, but it's too complex to use in the park. The 90 degree Fahrenheit index is working well and doesn't need modification. City officials and the mayor are causing the horses great harm by forcing them into the park in the new poorly located overcrowded hack stands which in some areas are without shade, water, and with new routes that do not have adequate rest or water. It's time to call in equine veterinarians to One, fix two, three, all the problems five, six, that have been seven, created. Eight, nine, ten, the City Council, Parks Department, DOT, and the Mayor need to stop playing God with the innocent Central Park one, carriage one, horses. One, 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 two, one, now, two, one, two, there is some confusion <laughs> about the human humidity index and the equine index, and your bill does not differentiate in favor of the horses, which should be an equine okay. index. Thank you. Right, Understood. And ma'am, are you speaking as well, or was this a joint? presentation. The horses shouldn't be in the park. There was more shade on 59th Street because of the buildings. And they're not mistreating the horses. I go there every day. When it's hot out, very hot and humid, the horses are not out. They, they don't come out in the heat, and they treat them good. Mayor Bloomberg never said anything against the horses. They, sh they don't abuse, they should go back in the 59th Street, and, and, and the, it was more shade, and, and they, they, they don't suffer. I see them every day, they don't suffer. They're not, they're not overheated. They take them in when it's hot and humid. The, I, I, I don't know what this mayor wants. That's not good. 
how he is, that the horses are well treated, and I go there every, every day and on the weekend, they're well treated, <laughs> and they should go back in the street where there was more shade. They're anyway in the street when, when they go from uh, uh, Fifth Avenue all the way up to Sixth Avenue and they go in there in the street. Anyway, so what's the point? <laughs> they, they should be back on 59th Street and they don't abuse their happy horses and, and they're not suffering in the heat because they take them in when it's very hot and humid. They're not abusing at all, not at all. And they should remain for the next 250 years. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. And we had one more gentleman on this panel. Is that right? Hi. Uh, hi. This is Ahmed Spilisi. Um, I'm horse carriage driver, Central Park. I'm driving horse carriage the last 15 years. I'm from original Turkey. Uh, I grew up up on the farm, farm. When I grew up, uh, we have all kind of animals. We have horses. I drive like horse, like even like five, six years old when I was kids. And I grew up. And then also ed I had education from the uh, uh, Istanbul University of Veterinary Faculty. Uh, when I came to here, immigrants, so I couldn't get my license. So I'm driving horse carriage. I love the animals. Uh, this issue is its problem is over here is people always talking about our business and people doesn't know about it people doesn't know in the business people doesn't know the horses over there and they just decide they discuss about us and then the problem they don't ask us they decided without us and then they say we change the law we have to follow this one and then get a broad problem and we have the regulation, we have the all law. We have winter, summer, time, all the regulation with the horse carriage. I mean, I, I saw the many horses, other different country, other state, other place, and I saw the horses in New York State also, Central Park. So this is a horses, believe me, is very good to take care of over there. This is very well take care. And I have the two kids. One is kids uh, seven years old, and he, he was two days ago, Father's Day, so he was waiting for me all day for spending time with him, but I couldn't get him because I was working in Central Park. I spend my time more than my kids with the horse. I spend time all, all days with him, and he's mad. So we are with the horses all the time. We could take care of them. We are very love them. Whatever is good for horses, we try to do them. But is this people that try to change one, two, this law like this is not help. One, two, one, two, it's going to be one, two, very one, two, affect us. It's going to affect the horses. So everything circulation is like real. If it broke some pieces in the between change, it's going to affect everything. If it's change law, we're going to lose a lot of day and a lot of like uh, probability. And uh, how we're going to pay this uh, horse bill, horse rent, shoes. Everything is affected us, and uh, our family, our kids, everybody's going to affect this. And uh, we don't say that, okay, it's, it's, it's uh, for bad horses, but it already has regulations. Nine degree is very good, very good uh, working. In the last 30 years, it doesn't have like, anything about horses. Any die horses, nothing happened. So that means uh, work with the horses. There's nothing wrong with them. Yeah. We don't need to change this one. Okay, thank you for your testimony. Sorry, we're out of time. And I think uh, I have one more statement. I handed it in to the sergeant. It's from Elizabeth Smith Price in Kentucky. Basically and, and, she's, and she's welcome to submit that. It's been submitted. Okay, yeah. wonderful. Thank you. And we thank this panel. We're now going to move on to our next panel, consisting of Jessica Safante, Stuart Mitchell, Maria DePalvis. The Blasio should leave us alone. <laughs> Roxanne Delgado. Quiet down, please, quiet down. Um, Roxanne. 
Sh Shimon uh, Shuchat, I think. Shai Navon. Caetano Laura Benavidier, Carol Hughes, and Joan Sample. Okay. Uh, we'll start here on, on uh, the far left of the table, if you're ready. Do you have access to the mic okay there? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, sorry. Um, my name is Shimon Shachat, and I'm speaking on behalf of In Defense of Animals, which is um, a national animal protection group with over 15,000 members who reside in New York City. We urge the New York City Council to pass Intro 1378 and make selling foie gras illegal in New York City. Our society inflicts many horrors on farm animals, but foie gras production is arguably the worst. Foie gras is produced by force-feeding ducks and geese enormous quantities of grain. The birds have pipes stuck down their throats and food is pumped directly into their stomachs. This process causes them physical pain as well as tissue damage and, bo and bone lesions. Bir the birds' livers expand to 10 times their natural size, which impedes blood flow and makes it difficult for them to breathe. They are also confined to tiny cages where they don't have enough room to spread out their wings and are unable to perform natural behaviors such as swimming and bathing. Solitary housing also prevents the birds from interacting with each other. This is a, this is a serious problem since ducks and geese are highly social animals who form close friendships and sometimes mate for life. Regardless of our ethnicity, race, religion, or political affiliation, we should all be unanimous in opposing and condemning cruelty directed at animals who are among our society's most vulnerable members. Foie gras is the epitome of such cruelty and has no place in civilized society. Ducks, geese, and other animals may not be able to talk, but their screams of pain and sorrow when faced with abuse go straight up to heaven and shake the earth. We urge, you to pass we, we urge you to pass intro 1378 and make New York City a more compassionate place for all its residents, whether they be human or non-human. Thank you. Thank you, Shimon. Okay, sir. Thank you for allowing me to speak. My name is Stuart Mitchell. I'm from the 36th District in Brooklyn, and I stand in support of intro 1378, the ban on foie gras. A short life spent on farms in cramped cages. Force fed two to three times a day is outrageous. Mishandled by farmers to feed the ducks rapidly, their disproportionate organs is one of many casualties. Fed through a funnel that causes bruises and lesions, stressed and unable to stand for obvious reasons. The act of gravage to fatten a duck's liver is the cruel backstory to an overpriced dinner. The unnatural and cruel treatment of these creatures should be replaced with admiration and beauty of their features. But this majestic bird's grace and presence is overlooked by the privilege who pay to have her enlarged organs cooked. There's people that will argue the process is humane, but they only speak that language because of monetary gain. They say people should be able to eat what they choose, but they're not the ones who stand the most to lose. To take the freedom of a life so pure and replace it with an existence of misery to endure, to be made into a luxury French cuisine for the selfishness of taste is a decadent deed. The time has come to say au revoir to the cruel inhumane practice of making foie gras. I also stand in support of intro 1475, the horse carriage heat bill. Horses are not vehicles, and bike bicycles are much more fun. Thank you. Among other things, I'm impressed by your ability to find a word that rhymes with foie gras. <laughs> First time I've heard testimony delivered in rhyme. Uh, we, we appreciate uh, your contribution in speaking out. Thank you for letting me speak. Of course. I'm sorry. Good afternoon. I'd like to thank you for your time and your patience. My name is Maria de Paulis from Westchester County. I'm an animal lover, a mother, and a grandmother. I'm here again speaking for the animals. 
I like to speak and make record today that I'm here to speak for them. I like my grandkids to know that I trust you. I hope you have the compassion to hear all of us speaking for the horses, for the dogs, for the squirrels, for the pigeons. The horses in the heat make me sad. When we come to New York City, my grandkids like the horses, they don't know what's behind this horrible business. This is a disgusting business for money that have gone on for too long. We have to stop this. The dogs being forci forcibly fed for an overpriced dinners, like he was saying, I remember in my country in Colombia, we will eat that. Without knowing at parties, we couldn't afford it. I think in here is the same. And I also like to speak for the squirrels and the pigeons. There is a tournament somewhere in New York where firemen sponsor uh, an event to shoot squirrels. I find that horrible. And pigeons, pigeon racing, pigeon shooting, I think it's horrible. Pigeons are in New York, are part of New York. 30 years ago when I came here, the end of my mother's life was easier and sweeter because pigeons will come to her window. They have a very special place in my heart. And I just wanna let you know that we have to have more compassion. Our society needs your intelligence and your compassion today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, please. Hello, how are you? My name is Roxanne Delgado on behalf of Bronx Animal Rights Electors. I'm in uh, CD13, I'm in CD14, SD34, AD80, AD34. I'm very involved in the political spheres in the Bronx. I'm, call, I'm asking city council directly, do you really care about geese and ducks? Because you really don't seem to care about those that reside in your own backyard. I'm talking about the geese and ducks in the parks that will be f starved to death during the winter because of a proposed agency park rule that will ban feeding them uh, in the parks. Not only is this cruel for animals, because it basically is a starvation campaign towards the squirrels and birds that have been exempt from the rule, banning wa feeding wild animals. And I'm not, here to feed wa I'm not here to advocate feeding wild animals. We're not here to feed birds, I mean bears and raccoons and possum. It's always been birds and squirrels have been, uh, they like urban animals that are not really considered wild. They've been interacting with humans for decades, for centuries now. For you to just cut the strings and eliminate the human support is quite cruel. Not to mention you're targeting the seniors and disabled people who are the ones, not only are the ones that are the first people on the poll to vote for you, but also are the ones that feed the birds and squirrels. And now they've actually called me, many from Morningside, Riverside Park, uh, Madison Square Park, my own park, in tears telling me that now they even have passerbys yelling at them not to feed the birds and squirrels because the parks agency had basically scapegoated them for all the issues that occur in the parks that's not related to them. For example, the rats. If you really don't want rats in the park, you just don't eat in the park. Don't uh, scapegoat a few seniors in the parks that throw a few crumbs and uh, nuts to squirrels. Regarding the safety for the animals, well, if the parks really cares about the safety, why do they not plant the trees that bear the fruits and nuts to feed them? Because I actually am a park advocate as well, and thank you for the Play Fair campaign uh, for the additional 43 million for parks. But nonetheless, I speak to the ground people. They tell me they cannot plant the trees that bear those fruits and nuts because they require more pruning, and they only prune seven, once every seven years, and also because they um, don't have the maintenance to pick up. To make this short, city council has oversight of all city agencies. Do we really care about geese and ducks? Take care of those in your own backyard because they will be starving this winter if this ban does go ahead and also you'll be uh, targeting seniors for act of compassion. Thank you. It's, the, it's, a, it's New York City Park City Agency. We had a public hearing on March 1st. We had a rally in City Hall with 65 people, many pigeon feeders, and it's an agency rule that could have city council review to ban feeding birds and squirrels in New York City parks. And I hope you really, if you really care about geese and ducks, please think about those in your own parks. Thank you again. Thank you, Ms. Delgado. I didn't my, take a stance, right? My name is Jessica Zafanti. Um, I live in council member Bill Perkins district. I am an attorney and longtime animal rescuer, and I focus on the rescue and rehab of waterfowl. 
um, and other birds, including pigeons. And as of last year, I've also been working with the New York City Parks Department to rescue and rehome domestic ducks that are actually frequently dumped in city parks. So first, I ask that the Health Committee and my council member Perkins pass intro 1378 to ban foie gras. As you've heard, the method to produce it is cruel, and no way the industry can portray it will change what is standard practice. Um, secondly, we, we have to think about when, when we hear these descriptions of what these facilities are like, is this even an appropriate place for humans to work? I mean, these workers deserve better too. As a rescuer, um, so well, second, I ask you to pass intro 1202 concerning the trafficking of birds. As a rescuer, I have fostered and spent a lot of times with pigeons and ducks. And people sometimes don't extend uh, their empathy to birds because they look so different from us and specifically because they express their fear and pain very differently from mammals. But that doesn't mean they don't feel the fear and pain as well as many other emotions. And they have very complex lives. Um, as you heard, the restaurant industry is complaining that we're taking away their rights and the uh, pr production industry is saying we're taking away their jobs. But throughout history, progressive laws have always been met with strong opposition, always arguing that's a violation of someone's rights or choices or jobs, even when those rights and choices and jobs are at the detriment of others. Every such law has been vehemently opposed from the law abolition, abolishing slavery to those requiring that children be vaccinated. But at some point, our government decides that the suffering of the victims outweighs someone else's wishes or choices especially when the victims are the most helpless and most vulnerable members of our society. So because the animals can't testify today, I am testifying on their behalf. Please pass intros 1378 and 1202. Okay, thank you. Sir? Um, hello, thank you all for your time. I wanna first quickly note the fact that just like when we were here to discuss the proposed fur ban, uh, we always see who stays uh, the course, stays uh, behind late, and has personally nothing personal to gain out of this, but yet we're still here to speak for the animals today. Uh, my name is Shaina Vaughn. I'm a resident of uh, <coughs> District 40 in Brooklyn. I'm a constituent of Council Member Dr. Matthew Eugene, and I also represent Total Liberation New York. We're a grassroots activist group dedicated to animal welfare and to fighting animal abuse as well as animal abusers. I'm here to express our strong support of Intro 1378, the bill to ban the sale of deceased and horrifically, horrifically tortured animal corpses as food, also known as the sale of foie gras in New York City. I apologize in advance if anything I'm gonna say is gonna gross you out, but it should. Foie gras is the disease and enlarged liver of a duck or a goose produced through force feeding. The standard practice used for producing foie gras involves violently shoving a metal or plastic foot long pipe down a bird's throat, then pumping him with so much feed that after three times a day for several weeks of these, his liver swells up to 10 times its natural size and becomes diseased. There's a reason why foie gras, this disgusting industry, is being banned throughout the world. It's 2019 and I feel like it's time that New York City evolves and does the right thing, does its part to ban these horrific practices that if any of us acted upon in broad daylight in any busy New York City street, we would definitely be looked at as, as deranged, be quickly locked up, arrested, and charged with horrific animal abuse, which is exactly what foie gras is. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Navon, and thank you to this panel. Um, we are racing against the clock. We have two more panels. Uh, the stated meeting starts at four, and so we're gonna try and move quickly here. Next I'll call Christopher, I think it's, uh, ah, forgive me. You, you can come on up and then uh, while I, you can start uh, or have a seat, I'm gonna call the next panel, but you'll be next to speak. Sure. Oh, forgive me, did, did I call you? Are you also in the previous panel? Great, have a seat. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, I'll tell you what. Why don't you two speak and then we'll call the next panel, please. Sure, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, members of the council. My name is Caetano La Prebonder, and I'm a New Yorker of French descent. I live in Bushwick and council member uh, Rafael Espinal, District 37. I would like to thank him for supporting intro 1378 to ban foie gras. 
Now I had to call in sick for work today to be here because I am indeed sick, sick of the fact that it is the year 2019 and my city still ignores the barbaric force feeding and horrific conditions these innocent animals are put through just so that a tiny amount of people can profit from or purchase this cruel excuse for food. If we had a duck or goose in this room and saw someone treat them the way they are treated in these farms, the last thing we'd think of is luxury or wanting to eat their livers, and the first thing we collectively think is stop this right now, please. The peaceful world uh, we all dream of living in and are working towards has no place for foie gras. I hope we get this over with and ban foie gras once and for all. And I, since I have a whole minute left, I would like to mention that I work as a freelance walking tour guide of New York City, constantly interact with tourists, especially I do tours of Central Park often enough, and I constantly, I'm ashamed of the fact that we still have carry, carry tours in the city, and sometimes I walk around with a group who is on vacation, uh, consensually walking around the park in the heat, in the rain, et cetera, in the cold, and they are constantly commenting about the fact that horses are forced to endure these situations. So I think it's completely reasonable to support intro 1425 uh, and actually every other uh, bill uh, mentioned or discussed today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, a lot has been said already, so uh, my testimony is just like this or maybe like that. But um, I am here in support of, of 1425 and I am beseeching you all to uh, pass the bill. These carriage horses have been through a lot and I can't believe we're still fighting for them. Uh, these things we demand for ourselves, but they can't. So I'm asking you to uh, end the suffering of them and, and ban it if it exceeds or reaches 90 degrees to pass that bill. It's humane, it's the right thing to do. And there's so much more to say, but I'm gonna let it go because I also am, uh, asking for you guys to humbly uh, pass 1378. Uh, I've just become uh, aware of it and it's horrible. And I, they've said it all for me. So I'm just asking you to, uh, I, I, I'm sorry for the people who have suffered or will suffer. I hope something can be worked out for them. Losing your job is not something that we wish. So my heart goes out to them and I'm hoping something can happen so that that won't happen for them, but these, these birds should no longer be tortured in this manner. All right, lastly, which has not been talked about too much, uh, intro 1478 and intro uh, 1502. Crea uh, 1478 creates a Department of Animal Welfare and Advisory Board to replace the Department of Health in control of New York City's animal care and control. And 1502 requires New York City ACC to report conditions surrounding euthanasia and uh, actions that took, they took to avoid it. I'm asking for your support in those bills and because uh, it is the New York City Department of Health, whatever role they have played in the past is no longer viable and does not serve the best interests of our abandoned and broken shelter animals. The DOH has cr uh, created, was created for the health and welfare of people, not animals. Our companion animals deserve more than what's provided for them at New York City ACC. They have loved us unconditionally and saved us from harm. I remember reading a story of a young woman saved by a stray pit bull, someone's discarded pet. The knife-wielding attacker stabbed the dog several times and although collapsing more than once, he got up and continued to fight for a woman he didn't even know. Uh, there are animals just like that today at New York City ACC being dragged to their deaths by the very people they've begun to trust. Their fellow animals look on in horror, barking and screaming, knowing they could be next. Animals coming in healthy, uh, contract shelter-borne respiratory infections, and some become deathly ill. Please, I urge you, please, help change this by passing these bills. I have adopted from the shelter, and, I be and I've been there, and it reeks of misery and death, and the animals can sense it, and they are terrified, and many are killed because of their fear. It's time to change, and you, uh, it's time for a change, and you could bring that about. And I thank you so much, and I wanna tell you that I believe you guys to be, as been uh, repeated by others, the most humane board, and I am pleased to be in the same room and breathe the same air. God bless you all. Thank you.
This is why I'm glad these remarks are recorded. <laughs> okay. And now we are going to call up our, <laughs> our next panel, which is Christopher uh, Wallach. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing the name. It's the New York City Bar Association Animal Law Committee. We have Vanessa Soul, Alexandria Lafata, David Karopkin, Rebecca Mil Milvich, Elizabeth Argabe. How did I do? John Di Leonardo. Sharon Disconfado. Desiree Matos. That was a lot of people. Let's see how many are still here. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, why don't you start since you're in front of the mic and ready to go. I, I'm happy to. Uh, good afternoon, council members, and thank you for the t your time. My name is Christopher Vlock. I'm the chair of the New York City Bar Association's Animal Law Committee here in support of Intro 1378, the bill that would ban the sale of uh, products from force-fed birds. Uh, the, the council should pass this law because it better aligns the city's laws with the city's values, like treating animals humanely. Uh, a bit about the laws, currently, Federal and state law don't protect these birds. At the federal level, you have two laws. The Animal Welfare Act contains an exemption for any animals used for food, while the Humane uh, Methods of Slaughter Act, Act doesn't even mention birds. At the state level, the state's anti-cruelty statute arguably could be used to stop this practice, but in practice, it hasn't been used. Uh, moreover, if you had a state ban on the act of force feeding, that wouldn't necessarily, ne necessarily prohibit the sale of products from force-fed animals. It would just mean a change of suppliers. Uh, if, if the council passes intro 1378, though, they can make a real step to, toward protecting these animals where federal and state laws have fallen short. Uh, and doing so would put New York City in line with a number of other jurisdictions. Uh, as someone mentioned, in 2004, California passed a statewide ban on the sale and production of foie gras. Uh, the Ninth Circuit upheld that ban, and then just this January, uh, the Supreme Court denied a petition for uh, cert. Uh, so, so that's the law in California. Uh, outside the U.S., well over a dozen countries already prohibit this practice. Uh, the U.K., India, Germany, Israel. I want to call particular attention to Israel because in, in 2004, when the Israeli Supreme Court issued uh, its decision that, out, that forbid foie gras as a product in the country, Israel was the fourth largest producer of foie gras in the, in, in the world and had over 45 foie gras farms. Nonetheless, the Supreme Court declared this, uh, quote, torture. And for those same reasons, the city council should pass this legislation as well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. And how about we'll continue this way, then we'll come around, please. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, yes. Oh. Just, there we go. Hi, my name is Alex Lafada, and I live in Staten Island in council member Joe Borelli's district. Um, for the last few years, I spend on average five to 15 hours at slaughterhouses per week. Um, I say a lot of times we also go to poultry houses on Sunday. Vanessa and I were actually at one. A lot of times the intelligence of birds specifically is really downplayed to make our treatment of them a lot more palatable. When we go to the slaughterhouses in particular, I was able to gain access two days ago. And when I went in, there was actually a few cages of ducks stacked up one another. And when I approach them, their immediate response is to act in complete and total fear. Their wings are often broken, their beaks are often broken, and they are in absolutely appalling conditions. If that's the way that they act when somebody approaching them to give them water response, can you imagine their reaction when people coming up to them with those metal prods to jam down their throats must be? These animals are genuinely terrified and kept in appalling conditions. The word humane is used very, very fast in use at farms and slaughterhouses. There really are no strict guidelines. It basically just means that you somewhat follow a very loose strict of guidelines. Um, these animals are in relentless agony for a product that 81% of New York City voters are against. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Hi. 
Uh, my name is Vanessa Soul. Uh, my grandmother is a seamstress who migrated from Sicily to Brooklyn when she was 17 years old, and now we comfortably live as a family in Staten Island, no thanks to depending on animal abuse as a source of income. I'm a constituent of Deborah Rose, and I'm here to speak in support of Intro 1378 because I believe ducks and geese deserve better. As a young girl living on Staten Island with all of its parks and nature, I felt a strong connection to the animals around me. Being in the park was always enjoyable because I would be surrounded by so many of my animal friends. As many children do, I would watch the ducks and geese in awe of their beauty and way of life. I would feed them and watch as they swarm to the food, such an innocent and peaceful activity. I learned about the bizarre process of fagua through transforming my lifestyle from non-vegan who didn't recognize all of the ways humans abuse animals to vegan animal rights activist who does the most she can to help and protect animals. When I saw the videos of ducks and geese with long rods being shoved down their throats and read that they are force-fed to the point that their liver grows 10 times as large, I couldn't help but think of my childhood memories with the ducks and geese in the beautiful parks of New York. As a New York State certified ESL teacher, I refuse to stay silent while other people indirectly teach children that treating animals cruelly is acceptable and moral. How can we teach children to be kind to animals like dogs, cats, and tortoises when we can accept that the fagua industry exists? Many people in the city are already op opposed to fagua. For example, over 60 rents, restaurants in NYC and 81% of residents do not support fagua. And for the record, I also support the other legislation presented today to protect other animals and any future attempts to reverse the long history of New Yorkers torturing other animals for our benefit. Please support New Yorkers during this important time in the world when humans are recognizing all of the unnecessary, immoral, inhumane, and unlawful torment that our fellow Earthlings endure because of us. Thank you. Thank you. If you want to, yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name is Rebecca Milvich. I live in East Village, and Carolina Rivera is my councilwoman. Um, I'm in support of all the animal initiatives here today. Um, I want to address one issue a couple of people have brought up, the gentleman who teared up about his immigration story and how he thanks the farm in which he works at for um, helping him overcome his struggles. Um, I hope that you as a panel can see through these types of distractions because it is a distraction here to have that type of story um, in, I guess, a contrast to what we're trying to talk about, the animals and their story. I don't think that gentleman would have the same thoughts to speak like that if he had the animals suffering right in front of him. It, it just wouldn't be that way. I just wanted to bring that up. Um, a couple other statements that were brought up, um, a quote, without foie gras farmers, um, without foie gras, the farmers would not be able to get free health care. Um, it's another distraction that I hope that you guys can see through. It's, it's, that's not true. Um, another one, if there is such a demand, the farmers would, must be producing it, it well. They're not its, they are sentient beings and that's why we're here and if they really see them as its, there's no way that any type of um, oversight could actually help the sentient beings when they're considered its by the farm producers. Um, I want to mention, of course, another gentleman that spoke about his addiction issues and how he solved them through the support of the farms, and it's very touching. And I, I feel for that gentleman, but I also want to just mention that that's another distraction from the point of why we're here. It's not about these individual people. It's about the sentient beings that have been forgotten for too long. And of course, I'm in favor of the carriage horse um, temperature ban. And I hope that each individual here on the panel have all been to the carriage horse stables and when you have it in the back of your mind, when you say, I'm an animal lover, I'm a horse lover, these are part of my family, we all know that that is not where you would choose to board your horse. You wouldn't. If You just wouldn't. So 
um, I'm going to conclude my testimony today just based on those. Everything else has been stated. And thank you for your time. And we're going to go back to. Hello, and thank you for your patience. Thank you, respected members of the Committee on Health, for the opportunity to address the importance of raising the bar for our city and humanity in regards to animals. My name is Elizabeth Argebe, a resident of Astoria, Queens, and I represent Total Liberation New York, an activist group whose mission is to give voice and meaning to a marginalized demographic in our city, the animals. As the daughter of immigrant parents, I feel compelled to address this in a way that would do them proud. Llegamos a una época cuando las conversaciones sobre los animales están reflejados con discursos de cambio, compasión y prevención de herirlos. Encuentro muy molesto oír que mi comunidad latina se refiere a tener el capaz de hacer solo un trabajo y un propósito. Tienen mucho que ofrecer la comunidad de Nueva York y su comunidad. Y les suplico que consideran sus acciones contra los sentimientos sentimientos de los animales representando la industria foie gras. No es justo de ver su vida por la vida de una criatura inocente. When we fail to put the needs of the innocent before our own, we fail society itself. New York City must deliver one message, and it's time to defend animals with everything we have. I beg you to ban foie gras in New York City and pass intro 1378, as well as all the other legislation that was presented today, and I want to repeat, those who are left behind have nothing to gain but to speak up for the innocent and for the damaged and for the ones that are treated the worst. And I appreciate your patience hanging in there with us and letting us all have our time. Thank you. Le agradecemos a usted, Doña Elizabeth, por su testimonio aquí en ambos idiomas. Mark Levine. <laughs> Próximo testimonio. <laughs> Hi, my name is John DiLeonardo. I am an anthrozoologist, a manager at PETA, and the executive director of Long Island Orchestrating for Nature, uh, the New York City area's leading domestic fowl rescue. I participated in the rescue of approximately 500 ducks and geese last year many of them in all five boroughs, and some of them millards, the birds most often abused by the faux gras industry. Millards are sexually manipulated, sterile birds who are created by masturbating male Muscovy ducks and raping female Pekin ducks with that semen. The ducks are confined to filthy sheds where they have no choice but to live in their own excrement and are denied all that is innate and natural to them. Um, such, wa uh, such as water to swim and preen in. Males are force-fed multiple times every day with pipes cruelly rammed down their throats to create an enlarged and diseased liver. Neither Pekins nor Muscovies are migrating birds, so talk about only force-feeding them before they would naturally migrate is nonsensical, even if you are to ignore the fact that no duck has a pipe shoved down his throat in nature. Millards are actually very sweet animals, so much so that when we found a millard abandoned in the Gowanus Canal last year, we named him Angel. Angel was special, but no more special than any other bird force-fed and slaughtered for foie gras. Ducks and geese have complex social structures, long-lasting memories, and display abstract reasoning from a very young age. Many mate for life, and mourn for lengthy periods when their partners die. Admired by park goers everywhere, ducks and geese are some of New York City's best known and most beloved animals. New Yorkers do not tolerate their abuse in our parks, so why should we tolerate their abuse for Fongwa? Please support Intro 1378 and get this cruel product out of our great city. And while you're at it, please support 1202 to protect the pigeons and 1425 to protect the horses. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I know we have one more uh, bit of testimony on this panel. And I, I, I do want to uh, somewhat belatedly respond to an earlier testimony on this panel um, that uh, referred to the workers as distractions. And uh, as somebody who thinks that we need to be pushing ever further towards policies that prioritize humane treatment of animals and that we certainly have a right to expect businesses to adapt as society's values evolve. 
Uh, I do certainly think we should have uh, empathy for workers, uh, including those who testified today. And um, while we might not agree with them on the policy, I think we want to still validate their perspective. And I'm personally glad that we did hear our diversity of voices today, uh, including the workers, uh, again, whose perspective uh, I do think it's important to hear. And with that, I'm going to pass it on to you to close out this panel. Good afternoon. My name is Sharon Discrefano. I'm a member of the New York City Bar, um, a New York City Bar Association's Animal Law Committee, and an advisory board member of the Wild Bird Fund. I'm also a member of your district, Councilmember Levine. I'm here today to testify in a personal capacity as a resident of the Upper West Side to support my, uh, to voice my support of the numerous animal-related legislation proposed today, particularly intro 1378. We've heard a lot about the delicacy known as foie gras, which is in fact a diseased liver. This is a public health concern as much as an animal welfare concern beyond this. It is produced and can only be produced by force-feeding birds. It is simply violent human behavior and as such should be unlawful. A ban on the sale is an effective legal approach to reject on a societal level this cruel practice. Intro 1425, as long as carriage horses are still working in our city, we must ensure conditions are improved for their health and safety. We need to address the fact that although temperature parameters are in place, they do not sufficiently account for environmental factors that impact the experience of temperature. We need to have parameters for the horses that rely on a heat index to establish the ceiling for humane working temperatures. Um, I want to just mention T. Uh, 2018-1189, um, which hasn't been mentioned, which is um, the city's voicing support for a state, legislator, state legislature um, to create a tax credit for the adoption for shelter animals. Um, I believe that this could work wonders in two respects, generating awareness about sh shelter animals and the great work our shelters are doing on behalf of animals and providing an incentive for New Yorkers to adopt rather than shop for companion animals. So many animals already in need of homes, and any increase in adoptions can also lessen the burden on overcrowded shelters. So less controversial, but no less important. Again, I support all the animal-related legislation we're discussing today. New York loves its animals, from the family dog to the wildlife of Central Park. And as the mayor's office has reminded us most recently with its wildlife New York City campaign, animals are New Yorkers too. We must always be asking ourselves, how we can do better as our own understanding evolves about animals' needs and we more fully appreciate their contributions to our own quality of life. And as our awareness expands, so too should our laws evolve to reflect that. Thank you. Okay, thank you and thank you for this panel. We are now moving to our final panel of the hearing. Hello, uh, excuse me, hi, I'm Oh, Sonia. forgive me, I did it again. <laughs> uh, okay, let me sit right there, thank you. P please. Uh, I'm sorry. Thank you so much. No, not at all. Yes. My name is Desiree Matos. I'm the president of Keeping Warm Dog Houses. It's a nonprofit organization that provides shelter to neglected backyard dogs not allowed to live indoors with their families. And I just want to thank the committee for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the animals and the many bills that are being passed today, out being introduced. I really appreciate it. We all appreciate it. Thank you so much. Intro 1378, banning the sale of foie gras, is one of the most important items on the agenda today. We have heard about the horrific way foie gras is created, and we're not going to go into that again. <laughs> if you didn't know, now you know. Uh, this is a barbaric and torturous practice that is unnecessary. Why would anyone want to eat the diseased liver of a goose or any animal for that matter? This is a health hazard for the consumer. We are not talking about banning of the sale of chicken, fish, beef, etc. We are talking about foie gras. A small fraction of the population in New York City are the consumers of the diseased liver of geese and ducks. I'm sure if they saw videos of the actual process of the force feeding of the birds, that they would reconsider their food choices. Geese can't advocate for themselves, which is why we are here to fight to end their suffering, pain, and slaughter. The fact that there are people present in, opposi in opposition to the sales ban of foie gras is extremely disgraceful. I urge the committee to vote in favor of intro 1378. Intro 1425, the carriage horse heat relief bill is another important bill that needs to be addressed. It is important to protect the horses from the heat and humidity to reduce heat stress, maintain their health and their well-being. 
These horse and carriage owners value their business, which pays their mortgages, their bills, provides their children's education, et cetera. If they value their business, so too should they value those who keep them in business, the horses. There should be no opposition to the basic need of protection for horses from, the, from working in the heat. I urge the committee to vote in favor of intro 1425, the horse and carriage heat relief bill. And I just want to thank the committee and the council for putting these bills on the agenda and helping to create a progressive and ethical and cruelty-free city. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And now our final panel. We're going to call up Chris Cobb from the Greenpoint Cat Club, Rita McMahon from the Wild Bird Fund, Jana Cisbaro from the Animal Legal Defense Fund, Hector, uh, I don't know if that's Sudan, and Jacqueline Stone. And uh, uh, please, you, I, th I think you can sit right in the middle of the table. I help out. Uh, <laughs> wow. There might be one more uh, uh, witness. OK. But you can start us off. OK, sure. So the Animal Legal Defense Fund was founded in 1979 to protect the lives and advance the interests of animals through the legal system. And on behalf of thousands of our supporters here in New York City, I encourage uh, you to support the intro 1425 to protect the carriage horses from dangerous heat and humidity. Um, a lot has been said on this. I'm just going to kind of reaffirm two small points which are in the handout that, I, uh, that we've submitted and that is an equine expert from the Department of Animal Science at the University of Connecticut found that because of the way horses regulate their internal temperatures, heat stress uh, is likely to result if the humidity is greater than 75%, regardless of ambient temperature. So I just wanted to reconfirm that point, and the notations and citations are on our document. And the second one is it's definitely time to update the way temperature is uh, measured in New York City, and the U.S. Weather Bureau cited temperatures readings can significantly uh, can be significantly lower than the actual temperature. And a Cornell University study found that the temperature or street level in New York City can be as much as a 45 degree difference um, from a recorded temperature. So those two points uh, I just wanted to uh, add to to the testimony. Thank you. Thank you very much. And would you be Miss Stone? Yes. Okay, please. Here you go. Mm -hmm. uh, can you hear me? I want to thank you because I know you have a lot to think about today. Uh, and thank you for letting me speak on behalf of our 500 uh, voting members for the Citizens Committee for Animal Rights that I speak for them also here today. For the passage of all the animal rights intros, especially the foie gras, I'm sure you have all the facts, and I only ask that America, being a civilized country, we must change these primitive, barbaric, brutal acts of cruelty in foie gras, and to help hold us America, our honor, as a civilized country worldwide. Uh, lastly, intelligent and good people know the difference between good and evil and understand you cannot turn an animal into a machine. It's against God and nature. There are thousands of choices to force-fed diseased liver. Cruelty to living creatures is the darkest crimes on the human conscience. And I thank you for all the good we can do from this today. Thank you very much, Ms. Stone. And thank you to everyone who spoke out today, who stayed till the end. Thank you to everyone for the respectful tone of the hearing. And this will conclude our hearing today. Thank you.